You're now live streaming, Chair. Thanks, Wendy. Sorry, I'm late, Chair. Thank you. Um, the meeting is now being live streamed and recorded for future publication on the Council's website. Please could I take this opportunity to ask that you turn your mobile phones off or switch to silent for the duration of the meeting. Um, also, when you wish to speak, if you could please raise your hand using the icon and keep your microphones muted until asked to speak, please. Um, just like to take this opportunity to welcome and thank all the external guests for their attendance today as well. Um, agenda item two, apologies. So I've had some apologies from Councillor Rudkin and we've got Councillor Tandy substituting. Um, I've had apologies from Councillor Lewen and Nash and we have Councillor Evans here subim. And apologies for Councillor Walmsley and we have Councillor Grant substituting. Also had apologies from Marcus Jones MP and Craig Trace, the MP as well. Um, on to declarations of interest. Has any member got anything to declare other than the interests on the schedule? No? Thank you. Um, item four, public consultation. We have got Councillor Condecor here today um, down as a speaker, which we will take after the presentations. So moving on to agenda item five. So COVID-19, following a request from Cabinet, the External Overview and Scrutiny Committee Chair has called this urgent meeting for the panel to discuss the effects of COVID-19 in our borough and seek up-to-date data and information. The desired outcomes of this review are as printed on page eight of the agenda. And we have down the first to speak um, is Chief Inspector Carl Faulkner. If I hand over to you, Carl. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank good you. afternoon, everybody. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm really pleased that uh, I've been asked to uh, present at the scrutiny panel this evening or this afternoon. Um, I've got a very short presentation, seven slides long, just to run you through um, the basic response, um, some highlighting options really around what we've done in Warwickshire Police to uh, cope with a COVID environment, if you like, and, and to say uh, to move on to screen or slide two. It's been a very challenging period for us since the beginning of COVID and how it's announced. Um, you'll all be aware that the health protection regulations came into force on the 26th of March and there's been um, a number of iterations around those regulations since uh, that date, which has created a number of challenges in its own right and, and different reasons, not just for the police, but for the public at large as well around understanding uh, and engaging with those regulations. Um, it's fair to say that our policing picture has changed rapidly over the course of that pandemic as well. Um, we have seen a real change in our crime picture. Uh, so normal crimes that you would expect uh, at this time of year to be rising. We've seen the adverse effects because of people staying home, self-isolating and being requested to stay home. So the likes of normal crimes of burglary and violence have, have dipped uh, and started to uh, take a downward trend. And some of those, uh, some of that picture in terms of antisocial behaviour, we've seen the adverse in that the ASB sort of uh, figures have increased significantly, which I'll come on to in a little while. I mean, in terms of our actual own organisation, we've had to almost stand up an organisation within the organisation, if that makes sense. And we've had to stand up a specific COVID team um, to establish uh, managing emerging issues, new ways of working, uh, response considerations around how our 999 calls have managed uh, and responding to emergency situations. Our own staff welfare and that of the public as well, we've had to consider in terms of how we try and prevent that spread of the virus. And of course, reporting mechanisms and communication between our organisations, uh, partners and stakeholders as well. Um, we've had a multi-agency communications COVID cell um, established through the local resilience forum as well, which has been a seen as best practice, re really good piece of work from the LRF and other agencies involved where we've pushed a lot of information and communication out to uh, our public and other agencies, uh, which has gone down very well from some of the feedback that we've had. And of course, through the whole process, we've we've had strong partnership links anyway uh, from Warwickshire Police with with the likes of the CSP and the borough uh, and other agencies um, as well. But actually, through COVID, that those partnerships have only gotten stronger, which is really good news. Um, in, in terms of our actual approach, 
Um, it's important to recognise and probably say that we don't actually have any powers to police social distancing, which there is a, a general misconception amongst the public that that is the case. It is entirely not the case. Um, and our general approach or policing approach is not a Warwickshire devised approach. It's a national policing approach, um, which we class as the four E's, which you'll see at the bottom of that slide on page two. Of engage, explain, uh, encourage, and then only as a last resort would we enforce any of the legislation that we have. Um, and that's a particularly proud point of view from our perspective within Warwickshire that we, we certainly do engage, explain and encourage. And that's seen through some of the figures that we will produce or show you on the next few slides around enforcement. Uh, so I'll go on to slide three. So with that in mind, in terms of the, uh, the crime figures in the ASB, uh, we have seen a significant reduction in main crimes that we would normally see. Uh, the concentration for us and where we've seen a lot of the pressure has been around antisocial behaviour. Uh, hence this slide, it will show you the figures uh, of, of, as a force for Warwickshire and uh, the Borough of Nuneaton and Bedworth um, around those ASB figures. So you can see on both tables, we have non-COVID related ASB. Uh, they're the figures that you'll see for normal antisocial behaviour. And then you have COVID ASB, and obviously that is um, ASB related to all COVID related issues, obviously that we've seen and recorded through separate reporting mechanisms to try and understand where that demand lies. So you'll see on the Nuneaton and Bedworth District one in particular, so January and February, the COVID ASB is down at naught uh, for both months. Obviously, the main issue started in March and you can start to see already that the, the increase in numbers from March is, is 18 and flies up to 447 in the April, which is almost double what you'd see from the normal non-COVID ASB sort of figures. So you can very quickly imagine that we're managing this on a week by week basis. Uh, the pressures on the police, um, not just our responses uh, and the community teams, but also into our communication centre. Um, you can imagine um, the, the disparate sort of information that's coming from different agencies, different partners and the public themselves and how we respond to that increase in, in demand. It was quite huge. And it's fair to say, uh, certainly the community teams and the 999 patrol teams were completely consumed um, by some of that COVID uh, response. Um, you could say, luckily, that the other crime types were reducing, which gave us the capacity to deal with the ASB. Uh, but all in all, it was really uh, quite a demanding period. And you'll see from the total recorded crime in Eaton and Bedworth in January, February, so January is 979, uh, February is 20 or 1058. Um, in March and April, we started to see that downward trend in figures. Um, and currently, as in July, those figures are now starting to increase and get back to where we'd expect from a normal point of view. So on to slide four. Uh, what I've done is I've put um, a graph on there to uh, so put some comparison between the Neaton and Bedworth to the districts across the county. And you'll see that the Neaton and Bedworth on that top right hand uh, graph is the orange line, the uppermost line, which will show that Neaton and Bedworth had um, sort of the most accountability for numbers in the county, but but not by uh, a great margin. Other count, other districts certainly were up or near there. Um, apart from uh, North Warwickshire and Stratford, were a little bit less. Um, and the bottom left-hand uh, graph actually shows uh, the the sort of the picture around when that ASB started to show and realise itself uh, amongst March, April, and May, and then starting to see the decrease again from from where we are. Well, from June through to where we are currently. And in terms of uh, fixed penalties and enforcement, so we, we very much engaged on the first three E's in Warwickshire uh, and the enforcement side of the picture shows that we've uh, we issued 39 fixed penalty notices in North Warwickshire uh, and 24 in South Warwickshire and 20 of those being issued out of the 39 in North Warwickshire were in Nuneaton and Bedworth. And, and it's something I have to say that Warwickshire is quite proud of in terms of the way that we've engaged with the public. Um, and through social media uh, and other media channels, we've had lots of really great feedback uh, and from partners and the way that partners have helped us deal with these things um, as to how we've actually approached, dealt with it uh, and, and policed the issue rather than being uh, not overly heavy handed, um, but we've actually, uh, to a degree, managed it very, very fairly. So we're quite proud of that fact, as is the, uh, the Chief Constable. So moving on to slide five. So challenges and lessons that we've learned. Um, Obviously, this is hopefully a one-off situation with the pandemic, but frequently changing legislation that we've seen 
uh, coming to the police has been a real challenge for us. Um, con- consistently updating our own staff, um, teaching, educating our staff around how to respond to this types of different types of legislation, um, and updating partners as well, um, and getting our partners to to understand and bring them on the journey as to what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve to the four E's so that we were singing off the same hymn sheet uh, and delivering a very, very competent service was was particularly a challenge in some respects, but in other respects, because of the relationships that we have with our, our partners and stakeholders, the CSP, um, in particular in the Neat and Bedworth, it became actually, in the end, really quite a fluid process and very good. Um, and you'd be interested to know that normally uh, what we have found, the new legislation didn't come by the government through official briefings, uh, we actually found out most of this legisla- legislation changed through the news, uh, Sky News and BBC News and other media channels. So we were being briefed by the media before we were actually being told officially. Um, Police and legislation and managing public expectation um, is certainly a challenge. So the legislation comes and it changes. Uh, we go out and try and enforce that legislation. And as you can imagine, the public uh, are confused over the four previous iterations of what's taken place. Um, and, and then it creates challenges in its own right about how we then deal with it. But the four E's approach that we've taken has certainly um, been, we've benefited from that and we have as a borough as well, to be fair. Um, it's important to note as well that the first, the first couple of weeks of the actual COVID pandemic, um, people were complying, uh, people were staying at home, uh, but we did recognise uh, as a partnership that we we're just waiting for the real impact of what's likely to occur. So when people become um, agitated and cabin fever sets in, people will start to uh, remove themselves from the home setting. And that's when we start to see uh, the ASB increase, which we did. Um, And again, also, uh, when when the actual uh, regulations start to be relaxed, the independence um, increases of the members of the public. And again, we will start to see more potential breaches, which we have seen as well. Um, so people began to explore more um, and police and communities became, particularly at that point, probably April time, end of April time, it, w- it was very, very uh, challenging for all the staff within the police uh, and with our partnerships as well, uh, tried to make sure that it was contained and, and the spread of the virus and the information in the news around that spread of the virus wasn't getting lost amongst our communities um, and that reinforcement, people in, in general were actually listening, which was great. Um, we see all large gatherings in parks, kids playing football, um, a general uh, almost feeling that the pandemic was over in some circumstances, which wasn't the case. Um, and that's where we saw most of our most of our issues and most of the ASB was coming in from sort of the larger parks around Stubbs Pool, uh, Riversley Park, Kersley Village, uh, an area within Kersley Village, and the Mines Welfare Park and Bailey Park in Bedworth in particular were the sorts of areas that we were seeing the issues. And of course, during that period as well, we had Ramadan um, and worked very closely with Abu Malik. Um, Really great work between Abu, Equip, ourselves, uh, Public Health England um, and Public Health uh, within Warwickshire as well to put uh, joint documents together that went out to communities um, to inform the Muslim communities about what was taking place and how to protect themselves. And again, in general, really, really pleased that most of the communities did actually listen and we didn't see any adverse effects from that at all. Uh, we also saw our normal meeting structures like most people and agencies were disrupted so uh, we required new technology new ways of working like exactly what we're doing now virtually we're in an, within a, an emergency situation uh, an emergency um, process it can be quite challenging so we've had to uh, overcome overcome those sorts of situations um, and managing social distancing again like other agencies has become an, an important issue for us especially in that emergency setting where we're having to um, have all our staff in all of the time despite um, uh, the pandemic uh, and attending 999 situations and then eventually coming back and spreading infection so we've had very very strict rigmaroles around um how we how we sort of deal with that process where we're coming in and out of workplaces uh, and then moving on to slide six so our current position so the latest set of regulations sees again another significant change um, in enforcement um, so we're now in a situation where, as you're probably aware, that no persons may uh, participate in gatherings which consist of over 30 people, but there are exceptions to the rule. Um, our current position in terms of how we police is exactly the same for in, for E, so we engage, explain, encourage and enforce. Um, so that there's no difference to the actual way that we police it, um, and we are expecting further changes, no doubt. Uh, and then on slide seven, Uh, there for everybody to read is the enforcement options that we have around gatherings and that's to direct people to disperse um, tell people to remove to to their place where they live and we can actually remove people with force if necessary but as I said 
uh, that's a last resort. Um, and then in terms of restricted areas, which is new legislation, uh, we can do the same again. Um, and in terms of preparedness, um, we, we are very now well prepared as much as with the partners and stakeholders for multi-agent responses. So if we were to see another spike within the pandemic, then we have processes in place where we, we are very well prepared to deal with that now. Um, and so the council, council lead agency uh, and manage any lockdown procedures for the new legislation around restricted areas uh, is led by the county council. Um, and I'd, probably more than likely might be raised. Uh, we are currently awaiting the legislation for the new face mask coverings and when people have to wear them within the shopping environment. So we've not yet got that legislation update, which we're expecting tomorrow. Um, and then we'll try and work out how we will then cope with that um, in terms of enforcement in that setting and that environment. So all in all, that's a very, very brief overview of how we dealt with it within Warwickshire Police uh, and amongst the partnership um, sort of role remit um, and environment. Um, it's been very positive, lots of lessons learned, um, but overall, some of the biggest positive is, is the partnership working, relationships have gotten stronger, um, and uh, it's altogether quite positive. And now that things are starting to return to normal, it's a case of making sure those really positive lessons are learned are carried on and those relationships continue. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, any member? Councillor Hancocks. Councillor yes, Hancocks. Yeah, it's just that slight delay, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. And just to start, can I put on record my thanks to the police and all the other agencies for the work they've had to uh, do during this period of time. Um, and thank the Chief Inspector for his report. And it is di direct about, you know, what we know about COVID and the, the police response. But I'd like to ask the Chief Inspector, and it may well cover other agencies, so they might want to cover it in their report. Um, could the Chief Inspector tell us what extra response they've had to give uh, in regards to extra domestic abuse problems and with children, obviously, with the extra time they've spent at home. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Good question. Um, one thing we did try and anticipate was, um, and acknowledgement like you have just recognised, that domestic abuse in the home setting might well increase um, during that lockdown period. Uh, but actually, it's been very stable. Um, so the actual figures that we've seen probably run pretty much as you would expect without COVID being um, or, or sitting in that COVID environment. So that expected spike that we would have seen from domestic abuse and other issues within the home setting, we've not actually seen and witnessed it. And we do, we do try and trace those facts and figures. Um, but despite that, we've, we've still carried out our, our work towards reducing domestic abuse and obviously offering help to those that are vulnerable um, and obviously dealing with domestic abuse as it occurs, but on the whole, to answer your question, it has remained stable and we haven't seen a spike. Thank you. Councillor London, did you indicate? I did, uh, but Councillor Hancock asked the question before me. OK, thank you. Councillor Evans. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Chief Inspector, thank you very much for uh, coming in front of us this evening. It's much appreciated. Um, in, in your um, statement, you made reference to uh, the new legislation. Um, and obviously, as part of that, uh, the police have been given the, the powers to issue fixed penalty notices uh, to those who um offend and break the uh new regulations um i just wondered at what point do your um constables on the ground and, and pcso pcso sorry issue those fixed penalty notices i.e if you come across someone uh, who's um uh violated or breached the regulations do you give that individual a chance and then if they if an uh, if a police officer comes across them repeating the offence is that when they issue the the penalty notice or do they just do it straight away? Yes, Councillor, uh, again, another very good question. Um, it, it's part of our four E's approach, which is which has enabled um, the police and response to be so effective, I think. Um, so we follow that very stringently. So part of the engage and explain process is to make sure that 
a member of the public would understand why um, we're asking them to uh, to separate from a group um, because of the spread of the virus and how it could potentially harm members of their own family, their own you know if they're, if they're vulnerable um, and could cause them particular issues. If if they don't sort of adhere to that engagement, then we explain as to the, the effects of what could happen to them, again their families, and or what might be the outcomes if they don't listen. Um, after explanation, if we then encourage, we, we then go down the route of encourage them to, to leave, that encouragement is a little firmer, um, and then if they don't listen, um, and we feel it's a situation where uh, they, that enforcement is required, and that's the only avenue that we've got in terms of them particularly listening, we will go down that enforcement route. So it's very much dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but also, like you pointed out, um, if it's a case we come across people that have repeatedly done that and they've been informed before, we will issue a fixed penalty notice. Uh, but within Warwickshire, what we have noticed through the 4Es approach, it's definitely a case of, in the main, and the majority of the members of the public will listen to what we've said after, after explanation. Um, they do understand exactly where we're coming from and the risks to their own families, their own communities, and do abide by those rules. Um, and with the figures I gave you earlier around um, the, the sort of low numbers that we've seen in Warwickshire, that, that sort of certainly shows us apart from particularly other counties across the UK in terms of how we've managed to deal with it. Uh, Chair, can I just come back on that very briefly, if possible? Yes, Councillor, briefly. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Chief Inspector. Um, uh, and if, if that's the case, I, I'm happy with that. Um, however, is it possible for me to have a, a discussion with you outside the, this meeting? Uh, because I've contacted 101 on several occasions to report um, a breach in a specific location by the same people um, on behalf of my residents. And the police have continued to go out to uh, speak to these individuals uh, and it's my understanding that they weren't issued with fixed penalty notices um so it, I, i've got the crime reference numbers and whatnot but I, if i could have a discussion with you outside this meeting about that specific circumstance that would be great and i know my member of parliament has also written to the chief constable about the issue as well yes absolutely councillor that's not a problem at all uh, i'd be more than happy to discuss that with you to uh, to, to see uh, what's actually happened and our response uh, from each of the circumstances that you described so we can we can work through that. Thank you. Councillor Golby. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just need to flag up um, issues that are local in the Arbury area. We've had significant problems with uh, antisocial behaviour uh, drug taking, um, parties, you name it, on Enzas, uh, Enzas Pool. Now, we've had locals reporting issues, uh, much the same as, as Councillor Evans, and uh, not a lot has been done about it. It's, it, it uh, I was quite disappointed to hear when you, you're talking about um, particular areas of concern that Enzo's pool wasn't one of them because I know that I was telling lots of people, uh, I was bringing it to the attention of lots of people that there were serious issues on Enzo's. As soon as the sun came out, we had people over there doing God knows what with, uh, you know, at all hours of the day and night. There were complaints by residents constantly. Um, and they feel that nothing was really done about it. I know the local PCSO actually said at one point she could literally put a chair on Enzas and sit there all day and be telling people to, uh, to, to basically stop breaking the rules, to get out of the pool, it's not for swimming. Uh, so I'm, I'm a bit concerned that this hasn't filtered down into the reports that are being um, presented. And um, we also have an issue with 101 where residents were trying to phone through to 101 and they just couldn't get through. They, you know, no one's going to hang on the phone for 20, 25 minutes, apart from me. Um, uh, and that's another issue that maybe has skewed the reporting a little bit is that people just gave up trying to report issues. Um, I, I know that I've, I've had a lot of frustration um, uh, presented to me over the last few months from local residents. So um, would you have a view on, on what went on with that particular area and why it's not showing up as, as an area of concern? Yes, thank you. It's, 
uh, it's, it's probably remiss to me not to mention Enders Paul, but definitely on our radar, um, certainly through Dave Williams and the team uh, within the Neat. And there was, like you say, there were uh, a lot of information, or there was a lot of information coming through to us, and we are aware of it. Um, but it, again, it's it's a picture that is sort of mirrored across across the county, really, in terms of those sorts of areas that get a lot of activity. Um, I'm not defending the fact that um, we've had lots of information and there's been little, if that is the case, seen from members of the public and yourself, your constituents around um, uh, police activity. Uh, but I do need to remind you that the, the amount of information, the amount of work and the amount of activity, engagement and visibility was unprecedented in the times um, that we're talking around the COVID pandemic. Um, certainly something that we we weren't um, sort of geared to, to deal with, but we, we have tried to do our best around that. Um, Moving forward, of course, if there's still issues, and I can certainly report that back, we can speak to yourselves and the community to try and work through how we can deal with that. Um, and around the 101 issue, that again, I can report back to our OCCI and try and establish and understand exactly what the issues were around that. And, and again, I have to reiterate that the volume of calls that was going into the call centre again uh, was very high uh, during that period as well. So I'm, I'm not trying to defend it, I'm just trying to be a little bit realistic around. Uh, the issues that we've actually seen and how we've tried to to police them um, our police officers and police staff have, have been put in some very uh, some difficult situations through the covid pandemic and, and dealing with numerous groups of people on their own which they probably normally wouldn't do certainly as pcso's um, but that said um, we, we can only learn the lessons from what you're telling us um, and we'll, we will then try and work with you to, to make that right and better um, if we continue to have those those issues so uh, my promise and pledge to you will be that yeah please get in touch after this and we'll try and work through those with you thank you councillor graham thank you very much chair and uh, thank you to the uh, uh, chief inspector as well I've got a couple of questions. First is um, relating to the uh, figures that were given for the last month, where you see a sharp drop in the number of COVID-19 related uh, antisocial behaviour instances, but a sharp increase in the number of non-COVID-19 uh, related. How do you um, categorise uh, what is COVID-19 related and what isn't? Because it seems to me that anything with more than one person is potentially COVID-19 related antisocial behaviour because uh, when you see large groups of people they're all, uh, almost never two metres apart and adhering to the guidelines uh, while also committing antisocial behaviour. Uh, so I'd be more interested in how you, uh, what's the word, um, define COVID-19 related so, uh, antisocial behaviour compared to non-COVID-19 related? Is there just a large increase at this time of year in people who are committing antisocial behaviour by themselves? And then the other question is regarding the new laws coming in regarding face masks in shops. Uh, do you feel like you're prepared for this to come into play? Because I've noticed that a lot of people even now still aren't wearing face masks in shops. Uh, I think uh, maybe they need uh, people to tell them that it's explicitly illegal to not do so. But I would have thought the common sense with a law coming in soon to make that illegal, that it would probably be best practice not, uh, it would probably be best practice to wear one in a shop. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on both of those matters and an explanation on uh, how you uh, categorise antisocial behaviour. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Good questions. Yes, sir. So for your first question around the antisocial behaviour and how we recognise the difference. So uh, we set up a, a specific uh, recording mechanism within the police um, through our OCCI, so our Operational Command Centre, um, and an intelligence cell, um, which, which created a separate operation, if you like. Um, so when we had reports come in and it was a potentially known breach of legislation, that would automatically be triggered as a, as a COVID-related ASB incident. As you've said, over that period in time, um, right from the very beginning, it's quite easy to understand those breaches um, and the, the water is certainly getting muddier and muddier as, as the legislation and the regulations start to release. Um, albeit, um, we, st we still do get phone calls with direct information saying it's a COVID breach um, and, and some, on some occasions it's very easy to recognise as a COVID breach because the amount of people that are involved in that ASB as well. So we try our best to separate the two types. Uh, we have very, a very strict recording structure and mechanism to recognise those breaches in two separate incidents from normal ASB to COVID. 
um, and, and without boring you and going into great detail, it would uh, it, it would certainly take some time to do that. But just rest assured that we, we do have that um, to a degree, um, and we will be seeing that the COVID ASB issues will all start to relax as obviously the regulations disappear. Um, and your second point around face masks, are, are face masks, are we prepared for it? Uh, the legislation hopefully we will get tomorrow um, and we probably well we have um, looked at what that might be in, in terms of how we respond to a in a police environment and that again will come down to the four e's the engage explain and encourage and then the enforcement how we actually enforce that um, may be very different and will certainly be a, a big communications piece around what that enforcement looks like and what the expectations from uh, law-abiding uh, citizens uh, and policing organisations and indeed our partners and stakeholders to assist in that communication piece to make sure that the members of the public understand exactly what they need to do and why they should be doing it will be critical in that fact. Uh, but also it's also incumbent on those those businesses um, and areas of leisure that, that will be accepting people in um, that they, they can have conditions of entry so that there's lots of other things that other agencies departments businesses can actually assist in that process so it's certainly not a one uh, one piece of um, legislation that just the police will be looking into it's something that all uh, all areas of business uh, and partners and stakeholders can assist with so what that actually looks like from a policing perspective at the minute we're not entirely sure uh, we don't know what the demand will look like or be it, it could be great it might be minor um, but with a clever strategy around communications, I'm hoping that that, that will certainly assist um, and deflate some of that demand that we could be expecting. So in short, it's difficult to understand what that looks like in terms of demand, but certainly the planning around that through uh, partner stakeholders and communication will alleviate some of those issues, I hope. Thank you for your answers. So Sorry, Councillor Graham, did you want to come back? No, just to say thank you for the explanation on how the uh, figures are given. I wouldn't worry about giving us long, boring details because we're an OSP. We're used to that and we thrive on it. So thank you for those answers. Thank you. Any other member? Yes, please, Chair. I think that's Councillor Shepherd. Sorry, Councillor Sargent. Thank you. Requesting to speak. Uh, yes, oh, I, I am. Um, yes, please. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, um, obviously, um, I also um, work for a charity that's in um, Neaton Town Centre, and we have given our staff um, instructions on if people don't come in wearing masks that they are asked to leave. However, we have a sanitising unit in front of all the charity stores that we have and we're already getting abuse from people when we're asking them to use the sanitising unit. Obviously, I do not wish to put any staff at risk. So what would your advice be if people come in without wearing a mask? Um, we do say that they have to wear a mask, but they refuse to leave. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, it, it's very much a case of if they're causing a, a problem at the time and they're committing a crime, then you'd ring 999 for assistance from the police and we'd attend. Um, your local PCSO and your beat manager within the town centre uh, will be coming around to the businesses and speaking to everyone in, in turn to ensure that, that the support is there and hopefully they can see that the support is there from the police. Um, but all I can say at this stage is if, if you do see and have problems at the door at the time, uh, there are threats and real threats there. Uh, for staff, um, then ring the police and, and we hopefully will attend uh, and come and assist um, for that process. Uh, if you need any advice around how to deal with that or, or what to do in any particular circumstances, once we've had the legislation come through tomorrow, we should be in a better position to be able to, uh, to obviously advise and hopefully educate um, businesses uh, across the board uh, and partners and stakeholders alike as to what's the best process, best, best form of activity and action to take in those particular circumstances so i know it's a bit of a non-answer at the minute but unfortunately we don't actually know what what uh, that legislation looks like so without knowing we can't really give a defined answer however should you see problems or have threats to members of your staff yourself then i would certainly re ring a 999 and you will definitely get the support from the police uh, thank you for your answer thank you chair thank you um, I don't have any other member indicating to speak. 
Um, so on behalf of the committee, Carla, I'd just like to thank you very much for your attendance and your presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. So moving on to our next presentation, which is by David Eltingen, Managing Director of George Elliott Hospital. Over to you, David. Thank you, Councillor Shepherd. Um, if I may, I'm going to introduce two of my colleagues who are um, clinical leaders at the hospital and far better placed to talk through some of the um, detail of the experience that we've uh, had in managing COVID-19 um, at the hospital. So um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Dalja Atwell, who's our Director of Nursing and our Director Responsible for Infection Prevention and Control. Um, and secondly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Catherine Free, who's our medical director and also happens to be a respiratory physician. So he's extremely knowledgeable um, in the field of, uh, of COVID-19 or as knowledgeable as anyone can be in the field of COVID-19. And um, Catherine's going to lead us through the presentation and then collectively we'll um, pick up any questions that members might have at the end of the slide deck. OK, thank you, David. Um, so I'm just going to run through um, some of the challenges we experienced at the start of the COVID pandemic um, and how we prepared for the pandemic. Some of the challenges we've, we've experienced since and then wrap up really with the learning. Um, and you're going to hear about our um, staff on a number of occasions through this. I'm hoping that slide will change yet yeah. uh, and really I just want to start and we will end by paying testament to our staff who have done a fantastic um, a fantastic job caring for patients but I want to mention not only the frontline staff you think of as doctors and nurses but people like domestics ward hostesses our procurement team the list is endless anybody who worked for us in the hospital played a huge role uh, in looking after patients and continues to do so today. So I think if I could take you back to um, February and the beginning of March, uh, you will recall the pictures that we were seeing coming out of Italy at that time. Um, and as an NHS, we were not quite sure what uh, we were going to face, but it was clear that we needed a lot of intensive care beds as a, as a nation. Uh, and we needed to provide a higher level of care for patients than we would usually be doing. Uh, at George Elliott, we have eight intensive care beds normally. Uh, we made plans to increase that number by fourfold. Um, we didn't have the staff to look after all of those people, so we retrained staff into critical care roles. Our theatre staff volunteered, and our learning and development team with the critical care team did a great job at supporting that. And we also trained surgeons to look after uh, medical patients, so people were very flexible in the roles that they were undertaking. Um, you will recall um, PPE was a big thing. Uh, again, I want to pay tribute to our procurement team because although there were a few hairy moments, George Elliott was really in a great position in terms of PPE and able to provide PPE mutual aid support to care homes, our partners in primary care, um, other organisations because of the really great work, um, the procurement team in conjunction with the nursing team. Um, in order to prepare for the activity we were going to see and expecting and did see, um, we um, followed national guidance on suspending routine operations. And because of the uh, risk of infection, um, in, also in line with national guidance, we closed the hospital to visitors, which um, I think Daljit may go on to speak about some of the challenges that provided for patients, for families and also for staff. Um, and one of the really great things was the way that we've worked together with local partners. So um, one of the things, areas we saw was a real uh, commitment to work together to safely discharge pa uh, patients faster who no longer needed to remain in hospital. And that was some great work with primary care colleagues. And of course, we took down all of the non-essential business and the meetings that fill our day normally, but seemed less important in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we had quite a good start in terms of our pandemic flu plan to help us to know where to go with making some of these plans. 
But one of the things that no organisation really was aware of at the beginning was how much oxygen these patients were going to need. And um, one of the challenges was about having a high number of patients with a high oxygen requirement in the trust. We work closely with British um, uh, British Oxygen Company um, and again um, managed all the risks around that but certainly a different way of working and uh, twice daily deliveries of oxygen to the site. And then the way we did things changed. So instead of patients being able to come up to a hospital, overnight we moved from face-to-face -face consultations to virtual consultations. Uh, and really that's something that we will continue to do for many patients. Um, that, that has transformed the way that we are delivering care rather than making the patient come to us. We're now using the technology available and that's been very successful both for patients and for uh, uh, you know convenience for patients and then uh, one of the things I think the police have just alluded to this but guidance changed very uh, frequently that's uh, because we were learning about something that we'd never heard of in December um, but the guidance on infection prevention control and PPE changed frequently and staying on top of that and making sure we implemented the guidance as it changed was um, something we did uh, as well. And then, of course, the testing around which patients we could test and whether we should be testing staff also changed. And we made sure that we complied with each change as and when it came about. And just to give you an idea of the timeline, our first patient was diagnosed in the trust on the 7th of March. Sadly, we had our first death on the 11th of March. We had a peak of inpatients in the trust at around the 8th of April. And then we had a second peak of inpatients uh, on the 5th of June. And I'll just go on to talk a little bit about that because that's probably uh, one of our more recent challenges. So uh, in June, we saw a high number of cases in the hospital and that was due to a mixture of an increase in community acquired cases and also some cases that we believe were acquired in hospital. And I'm gonna hand over to Delgit now to just lead us through some of the learning that we got from that and how we've changed practice uh, as a result. Um, thank you very much, um, Catherine, and evening to colleagues. Um, but thank you for inviting us and just giving you some insight into what's been happening inside George Elliott Hospital. So as Catherine's described, we were, um, we've been living in a very challenging environment. It's been con quite complex. Um, lots of different guidance coming out and lots of very difficult um, decisions to make. Um, has Catherine's also stated that in the um, end of May and the, and the beginning of June, we started to recognise that we had increased incidence of hospital acquired infections and we very quickly put together a very comprehensive plan to tackle some of the issues that we were recognising. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that this plan has resulted in that we have in the in less than three weeks we have managed to get on top of some of the challenges that we had and and are in a very positive place at the moment so before i go into um what's on the slide around some of the key lessons we learned i'd just like to give um colleagues some um context of of what the issues were that we identified that had caused some of this that were um, associated with the um, increase of um, numbers in the community and, and naturally we started to see those numbers come into our hospitals. So many of you will know about George Elliott Hospital and, and you will know that it's a small hospital and that our side rooms uh, are lacking in numbers. So that was one of the challenges that we've had to face throughout of the throughout the pandemic. And um, as we've had increased patients come in, that's made it very difficult for us to um, have enough rooms where we could quickly isolate people. The second challenge we had was that um, we did not have any local um, testing facilities our results go to the University Hospital of Co Coventry that's where our swabs go and that's where we get our results um, and that often meant there was a delay and therefore we weren't able to isolate patients quickly and move patients into the areas that they needed to. In addition to that, we identified that we were we were moving patients quite a bit to try and keep on top of ensuring that, you know, we were minimising opportunities for cross infection. And, and in doing that, um, I think we had caused some challenges for ourselves. The other thing I think it's really worth highlighting is that um, actually um, diagnosing um, COVID is quite complex. 
many of you will know you can get a result which is negative, but may not mean that that patient has not got COVID. So this complexity also added to some of the very um, challenging decisions that we had to make. So what we quickly recognised was that what we needed to do was to review, reduce our patient movement. And we needed to ensure that we had clear designated areas for our patients to be. And we developed four categories. We had a category for confirmed cases. We had a category for our confirmed um, so positive cases and our confirmed negative cases. And we also then had our pending cases. And this is where we thought um, that either a patient had a high suspicion of having COVID, but we were still waiting for the results, or they had a low suspicion of COVID and we were waiting for their results. That meant if we did have patients where there was a high suspicion of COVID, we were not ensuring they were in, in the same place as the patients with low suspicion, which would have an impact on, on cross-infection. The other thing we did very quickly, which also enabled us to reduce our patient movement was, was that we started to close our close our wall, base on our wards. And in, in one case, we actually closed a ward until we knew that all of the um, cases were, were negative. We moved um, our patients that were posit positive onto other areas and ensured that those patients that had been in contact with patients that were positive, that we closed those bays and we could monitor them closely for any symptoms of developing COVID. In addition to that, as Catherine's described, we were at this time swabbing all our inpatient admissions. And what we managed to do, which is um, supported in our, in our testing and tracing, was um, University Hospitals um, Coventry and Warwickshire agreed to prioritise our results so that we got a faster turnaround and we were getting our results back within two hours, enabling us to timely um, move patients to the right areas. In our outbreak areas, we ensured that we um, tested all our staff to ensure that they were not asymptomatic carriers. And that was very helpful in um, identifying both staff and patients that needed to be contact traced as a result of that. We've been doing symptom checking on all our areas and we enhanced this to ensure that um, all staff in all our areas, particularly the outbreak areas, were being symptom checked at the beginning of each shift. In addition to that, we have just nearly completed a more hospital-wide um, schedule of um, surveillance and screening of staff that are patients safe in, safe in. Next slide, please, Catherine. Okay, so I think it's fair to say that uh, when we when we went into the pandemic, there was a level of uncertainty, and and I'm I'm happy to say that we've come through this with. Um, some knowledge and some skills and a better understanding of what we need to do. We recognise, though, that, you know, with winter upon us, we will have additional challenges as COVID has not gone away. And we expect to still see um, numbers of COVID patients coming into our organisation. So we're already planning what we're going to do to ensure that we can minimise any impacts of COVID patients on, um, of cross infections across the organisation. And in relation to that, what we've been able to do is to um, secure two new 15 bedded wards in a, in a modern modular ward, which, uh, which will be opening in um, September. So we're pleased to say that so far that is to plan. And so we will have additional beds to take us through the um, capacity issues that we may have during the winter period. Alongside this, we're actually pursuing some funding for some new operating theatres alongside these new wards. So we're very positive about that and we've started to do our staff recruitment for those areas as well. In addition to that, we've just been finalised at the moment with our clinicians. We are starting to look at separating our areas for COVID and non-COVID and ensure that we can maintain these throughout the months that are coming and over the winter period as well. And we've got escalation plans to kick in, depending on the number of COVID-19 cases. So what that means that we will be able to flex our capacity and our workload, pending the number of patients that we get with COVID, so we can continue to deliver emergency and elective care. Catherine, over to you. Okay, so just to sort of finish off with some of the learning that we've had. Um, so we've already alluded to the things that we'll keep going with after COVID. COVID has changed the way the NHS works nationally. 
um, and the things that we're experiencing, what other people are experiencing. But I think locally, I think we can be proud of the working we've had with primary care, the support to care homes, um, and the relationships have been strengthened through a period of uncertainty, which will be of benefit to patients. Now we've formed those closer understanding and, and working relationships. Uh, as I say, we've improved our discharge procedures and that is continuing, um, even though we're moving to an area now where the number of cases has fallen very significantly. Um, and the virtual consultations, we will continue to run those where appropriate. We are starting or have always been able to see people face to face where that's been needed, but increasing um, appointments now. Um, so, uh, but certainly the legacy of virtual consultations will remain both in, in hospital, but also in GP practices. And um, we've, as Daldrich alluded to, it's a complex disease. You know, we can have people who are asymptomatic, don't show any signs of COVID wandering around fit as a fiddle, through to sadly young patients dying of the disease. We have a test that is accurate most of the time, but in up to 30% of cases could give you a false positive test. So it could, a false negative test, I mean, so reassure you that someone hasn't got the disease when in fact they have. And so we're learning more about the disease all the time. Getting back to normal and restarting activity is a lot harder than stopping it was. And what I'd really like to say to you all now is we need help to encourage patients that our hospital is safe to return to. Other diseases like cancer have not gone away. And we're seeing that patient behaviour has changed. People are deferring appointments saying, I'll come back after this COVID has gone. And, you know, realistically, COVID may be with us for many months or years to come. And we need to make sure that the hospital is providing care for people whatever the condition is that they have. Uh, and we've done a lot of work to make sure that our pathways are safe so that people can come back with confidence. Um, and I really want to encourage people that if you need hospital care, it is there for you. Um, in terms of the communication, um, we uh, learned to work closely with partners and Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council was part of our communication cell during the second peak in cases. And I think we've improved the uh, contact with stakeholders and the political leadership. Um, and we've agreed system-wide communications protocols and work is undergoing with the comms teams in both areas to map uh, stakeholders so that we make sure that people are informed at all stages. And Dalja, I'm gonna hand back to you to just talk about our fantastic staff and community to end with. Thank you very much, Catherine. So last couple of slides now, really. And um, these slides are really about thanking the most important people in all of this. And, and that is um, our local community. They are the people that within your cons cons constitutes. And also I want to play, pay a tribute to um, our staff. So um, I think it's really important to recognise, and certainly we recognise at George Eliot, that our staff are as much as members of the local community as they, they are of the hospital. And there is, is a very strong connection between the hospital and the community. And, and certain, I, sent, I certainly sense that from all the organisations that, that I have worked in. And for that reason, our staff really do take a lot of pride in the care that they give. And um, as you can tell from what we've described and certainly from a lot of the media and TV programmes that you will have seen that our staff have probably been under the greatest pressure that they're, they're, they have been in, and uh, ever in their lives and um, and we're really immensely proud of our staff. Um, what they have done is, is quite remarkable and um, what they have delivered is, is been outstanding. They have worked under consistently high pressure, which has continued for us from that first case that came into our hospital. And um, we're starting to see now a bit of, um, uh, you know, starting to quiet a little, quieten down in the little in the hospital. And we can start to see that staff are having an opportunity to, to reflect and recover. What our staff have shown is how flexible they are and they've got a real can-do attitude. Nothing has been too much for them. Every issue and problem that has, that has come up, they have found a solution and ensured that we can care for our patients with compassion. One of the most difficult things I know has been for us um, and, and definitely know it's been for our local community and for carers and, and for patients, it's been that we've, we've had to stop visiting um, and that's been really hard. 
and and staff have found all different manners of ways to try and ensure that loved ones can um, stay in touch with their families and that patients can send messages to their loved ones and to their families through knitted hearts and through um, using iPads for um, families to talk to each other. And, and we've got some um, really lovely, um, actually tear tear jerking stories of what our staff have done to ensure that you know loved ones stay connected with their um, families. Um, so looking after our staff has been probably one of the most important things, and 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 all throughout all of this. But we, I think, we're going to see the impact of this on them for some time to come, and and we're really mindful of that, and we're doing as much as we possibly can in terms of supporting them through a range of sanctuary places, wobble rooms, and also providing mental health support. Next slide, please, Catherine. And finally. Um, what an amazing community. That's all I can say. I mean, I have just cannot thank you all enough and, and all your um, areas that you, you oversee for the support that you've given us. And I don't want, I, I really feel that words can't say enough in, in this situation. You have supported us um, throughout. You have given us strength and courage. Um, from food to equipment to kind words and letters, which have been really moving. And we have been overwhelmed by this. Um, just by being there, we have felt that you have been with us. And um, we. it is our desire that we continue with that connection and that we um, continue to um, support our local community as, as well. I want to give a big thank you to a number of our volunteers. I'd particularly like to say thank you to St. John's Ambulance, who have been absolutely brilliant in the support they've provided to, to us. We have recruited throughout this period hundreds of volunteers of all different ages, age groups who have helped to care for our staff and also care for our patients and their loved ones through a variety of ways. For example, um, we set up an area at the front of the hospital for loved ones to drop off property or collect property. And we also had many of our volunteers going out delivering equipment to, page, to patients. There have been so many things that volunteers have done for us and um, they have been as an important part of our, the way we have dealt with the pandemic as the actual staff that, that we employ. So um, a thank you from George Elliott board and, and all our staff to all of you. Thank you. And it's not over yet. <laughs> so we're yeah, happy so to take any questions. None of us know what's coming uh, in the future, um, but you can uh, rest assured that the hospital has learned a lot, made plans, and you know we hope our staff get a small rest. But um, yeah, I think we've got more of this to come. Happy to take any questions. questions. Yes. Councillor Shepherd, are you still with us? Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, we seem to have lost our chair. Yeah. Um, in, in which case, whoever's the designated deputy or vice, can they take over in the meantime? Um, we just need to try and get our chair back into the meeting. If you of course, can just yes. bear with us a second. Wendy, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Chair. Are you back with us? I am, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties this evening. <laughs> um, I've got Councillor Golby down to speak first. Thanks, Chair. Thank um, you. Sorry, I'm not sure I should have, I don't know if I needed to declare this 
at the beginning of the meeting, but I did miss the beginning of the meeting. So um, I actually did some volunteering over the um, lockdown period at the George Elliott. So um, I don't, you know, just to get that on the table. Thank um, you very much. That's <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, good news about the ward, um, the extra ward that's coming. Uh, and if there's anything that needs to be done for supports for funding for the theatre, please, please let let us know because there is no doubt we will we will support you in everything that we can do for that. Um, I just really wanted to. Um, sorry, I've got a helicopter above, and it, it sounds like it sounds like it's trying to land on my ass. Um, so, virtual appointments have been an absolute godsend. Um, and whatever can be done to enable those to continue both in primary care and um, in secondary and tertiary care, if, if that's how far they've gone, please can we make sure that that is um, passed up the chain. It's um, I, I've had reason to use virtual appointments on a couple of occasions over the lockdown period and I can see actually how it would work in a non-lockdown situation which somebody who's working full-time or um, is pressured with children and things like that it's 10 minutes on a phone call rather than half an hour out of work to get to the doctors and and then everything else and you know a big chunk of time it saves time for the patient it saves time for uh, the clinicians as well so if we can keep that in in sort of peacetime circumstances I think that would be a really big step in healthcare uh, and healthcare provision uh, throughout so anything you can do to to make that happen would be brilliant thank you very much of our plans it was part of the nhs long-term plan anyway to increase virtual and um, virtual appointments but for all the reasons you've just said and because we are still needing to maintain social distancing in hospital we cannot have crowded out patients anymore and um, so um yeah virtual clinics are here to stay if i may chair it's it's been a bit of a baptism of fire but i think it has forced the issue uh, and you know maybe we would have been a couple of years down the line had this not happened so you know at least that is a positive that's come out of this mm -hmm. negative situation thank you chair thank you councillor tandy uh, thank you chair <clears throat> excuse me I, I doubt that um there is anyone who would complain about the services we've received from, from uh, the George Elliott's hospital or elsewhere for that matter. And I personally have heard nothing but uh, praise with the usual exceptions, which I suppose are inevitable. Um, and I do appreciate the initial problems that occurred. There was just one issue that I wanted to take uh, a bit of time with. In the first part of the presentation, there was mention about um, by Catherine about care homes and about um, how care. I have personal experience of the fact that at least two people who were sent back to care homes from the hospital had not. Uh, they refused to take them back because they hadn't been uh, tested for COVID um, and. Uh, hospital weren't overly happy with the fact that they weren't allowed back into the homes and the other issue and I did hear many many people speak to me about it about the fact that PPE uh, was not made available to the care homes uh, in, a, in a timely manner um, but that's in the past and hopefully that will have changed I think as well, when we talk about the virtual appointments, I don't have a problem with that. And like everyone else, I've had to use that facility <clears throat> when I've needed advice. But I think a question would be for me um, is there may have been referrals from GPs through to the hospitals in relation to perhaps surgical procedures that have been uh, needed, where I, I absolutely understand the situation with social distancing, 
But, you know, uh, I'd really like to know if there is any possibility of people who are in need of surgical procedures, perhaps even minor ones, if there is any opportunity for any of those referrals to uh, to start happening, you know, because it even those minor surgical referrals are causing problems for several people. Thank you, Chair. OK, well, I'll... I'll, I'll go and uh, David and Daljit chip in if, if there's anything you'd like to say. I think in relation to the first point about care homes, it is certainly true that our experience of getting PPE in the initial stages of that was pretty difficult and that was as a hospital trust and I think individual care homes were having a much harder job than hospitals. I think um, primary care has done the most work to support care homes and done a lot more in terms of putting additional support in. I know Delgit and team have put additional IPC support into infection prevention control, sorry, slipping into a bit of mm. jargon there, into um, uh, care homes. So uh, I think there's learning there. I'm not sure nationally we got it right, um, but I certainly think that the situation now is much improved and the relationship between primary care and the care homes and certainly the issues about PPE and things are now fully resolved and I think the strengthened um, input from nurses like Delgit who leads for us as an expert on infection and prevention control to those care homes it leaves them in a much stronger position now than they were at the start of this. In terms of the question about face-to-face -face versus uh, virtual you can't replace everything with virtual clinics. You can't look in the back of somebody's eye or feel a stomach or those sorts of things. So we are have always throughout this been able to see people who need to be seen. What I would say to people is at the moment, the way that we're standing our work back up again is that we are prioritising cancer patients, urgent patients and then patients who've been waiting a long time for things so the routine procedures will be some of the last things that we're able to get back up now some things that's not a problem for so some of our medical specialities will be able to get back to 100 percent of their work but for some of our things like a hip operation or a knee operation that's going to take longer whilst we make sure that we've got space to see everybody with a cancer diagnosis who needs it as soon as possible. Um, thank you, Catherine. I, I um, just want to add, um, thank you, Councillor Tandy, for your question about nursing homes. But just to provide you assurance that we have a very positive relationship at George Eliot with our nursing homes, our infection control team, or even before COVID involved them in our um, link trainers um, updates and they come along to our, our training sessions and um, we also took a um, positive position um, that um, and, and this still happens now that when patients are being discharged to nursing homes we will provide um, additional PPE for a few days if that enables the nursing for the, for the care home to look after those patients. You're on mute, Tracy. <laughs> Councillor Brown. Th th thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to start by um, offering my personal thanks um, to everybody at the George Elliott Trust and in the care sector for the brilliant work that you've done and the uh, amazing flexibility and uh, the, the way you've adapted to this this crisis which as, as, as has been said many times is unprecedented and it's an evolving situation and I think probably the first thing that we can all accept is that anybody at the outset who said they were an expert on this has been proved to be wrong um, because we're all learning um, and I, I, I think it's probably right to say that, um, that you've done fantastically with the tools you had at your disposal and the infrastructure that existed as it's existed. Um, you know, we, clearly we could not manage a crisis like this by managing it on the basis of an infrastructure we would have liked to have had. We had to deal with the tools that, that we actually had. And um, 
I'd like to thank you for involving the care, care sector uh, by providing PPE you know, when it became necessary to do so, even though you know, the, your, your procurement people were not really responsible for procuring PPE for care homes. Um, it wasn't part of your job. So I think that's a, a, absolutely fantastic. What, 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 um, I'd also like to add uh, the virtual appointments, you know, fantastic as far as they go, and I'm pleased to hear about that and the new wards. Um, one thing I'd just quite like to we obviously the, the, the hospital takes in patients from a, a wider region than just the Neaton and Bedworth area and the, the, the treatment the patients from the Neaton and Bedworth received there was no different protocols or no different type of treatment for people from the Neaton and Bedworth to the other patients was there? All our patients got treated the same. Yeah uh, it, it's just that obviously we, we're going to come into a point where we're looking at rates of infection and cases uh, as compared to other places so uh, it's it's the, the the rate and things like that and the outcomes are not the the, the um, down to the procedures within the hospital they're from outside factors yeah that that's correct so one approach to dealing with any patient who needed to come to the georgia elliott hospital yeah, it's, it's just a, a, I want to establish this because there's been some comments on social media and things that Nunny in Bedworth has been treated differently or that PP no. wasn't available and things like that. And I think it's important that we get that message out there that the procedures were the same. They were, so, and I can and I can provide you assurance that the the hospital always had adequate supplies of PPE, and there was not one day where the hospital did not have enough PPE or had to reach out to any other organisation for that. Th 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 thank, thank you very much. Uh, I may come back with other questions as I think of them, but that's wonderful. Thank you for the, the help and, and thank you for your ongoing support throughout the community. No problem. Thank you. Councillor Daffin. Hi there. Um, first of all, um, I also want to place on record my uh, personal thanks um, to everything you've been doing up the George Elliott Hospital. Um, I've kind of been in and out of there myself a few times during this period, so um, definitely grateful on a personal level. Um, first thing um, I wanted to ask about, we've asked a, a few questions about uh, appointments and, and some of those appointments that have to um, happen face to face. Um, I was just wondering what the percentages were like in terms of unfulfilled um, appointments that that were um, supposed to happen during this period face to face, um, because obviously that obviously incurs a, a cost to the hospital and and it's also that looking forward at some of the things that we need to learn and uh, we need to kind of bear in mind for future risk is um, obviously going to be people not getting the referral where they need it. Um, so it's probably useful for us to know. Um, a percentage if we if we've got one about um, un, unfulfilled appointments and people not turning up to um, appointments because they don't feel confident enough to do so um just another kind of observational um, point as much as much as it is a question um during um, may in particular it seemed that doctor's surgeries were doing temperature checks and kind of enforcing use of masks and um and, and that process whereas um at that kind of same time, um, the George Elliott Hospital, um, they weren't doing those temperature checks and um, it, it kind of forcing people to wear masks. And I was just wondering, um, at what point did that line up between doctor's surgeries and the hospital? Um, because I know that a couple of weeks later into June, that was happening at George Elliott. So I was just wondering um, where... Um, that decision making came from and um, and what was the best practice on that and why was that decision made when it was? Okay. I'm happy to to answer that in terms of PPE. So our our staff, um, so the first thing we, we've always done, both Catherine and myself, is, is um, been very vigilant about the national guidance around what we need to do, um, bearing in mind that that, that, has con that has constantly changed. So everything that we've done and implemented has been exactly with the timescales nationally that are required. Uh, sometimes we've had to make additional um, decisions based on our own care environment, but that's largely what we have followed. So from the outset of, um, of COVID, all our staff 
were wearing PPE on the wards, depending on the, on the kind of ward that they were working in. And then laterally, I think sometime probably in June was when the government guidance um, came out that um, so these were in clinical areas so every ward area um, depending on the type of patient they were looking at would have to wear a certain type of PPE and all, all our staff were provided with that and were wearing wearing that um, I think probably um, June time the national guidance came out and, and Catherine can correct me that there was an expectation that in all clinical areas that included corridors and um, offices staff should be wearing PPE um, particularly if they can't social distance which might be if you've visited the hospital more recently you will see um, staff wearing masks everywhere but I can assure you that um, our staff were wearing PPE when they were looking after patients in line with national guidance. It was more, sorry, it was more yeah. a point about um, patients going in. So um, in terms of doctor surgeries, I mean, patients going in and yeah. uh, being given face yeah. masks and then yeah. uh, the same experience at the hospital. And it just, it yeah. seems strange to me that in a doctor's surgery it seemed to be a bit fortified and you had to yeah. kind of do temperature checks and wear a mask to even get an entry whereas at the same time um at the hospital um patients were able to kind of walk into their appointments with no checks and no masks on at all and that seemed to be a bit of a discrepancy i, d I just wondered where that came from and if it was to do with um guidance that you're getting differently for hospitals to doctor surgeries basically yeah so uh Go on, Catherine, were you going to well, say Well, I was just going to say that actually the national guidance only applies to hospitals. I don't think it actually applies to primary care settings. So they were acting ahead of the guidance change, I think. And yeah. I see in the papers today that the BMA are calling for the same guidance to be applied to all GP surgeries as well. So um, we, we changed our guidance in line with the policy, although where people were being seen face to face, there should have been things like oh, symptom yeah. checks in order to make sure that, and obviously we've been quite clear, please do not visit the hospital. We haven't had any visiting, but for people attending for appointments, don't come if you're not well. Um, and and yeah. that continues to remain the case. Yeah, and and and, I, and and just just going to add to that that you know we had obviously um, stopped visiting except on on compassionate grounds and and where we did um, facilitate that visiting we had very clear guidance about what PPE visitors were required to wear uh, depending on which area they were visiting. If I can answer your other question about um, um, waiting lists or missed appointments. I can't give you an exact figure because it varies quite a lot between the different specialties depending on how urgent the specialty is compared to how much routine care they deliver. But if I could give you the example of um, a condition called colonoscopy, which is a telescope test to examine the bowel, there's a lot of patients at the moment saying, well, I, I, I won't come for this test at the moment, maybe because it's not a pleasant test to have, but people saying, well, I'll wait till COVID's over. We are asking patients before they come in for some of these tests and particularly before operations to self-isolate for a period at home and then be tested to make sure they haven't got COVID before they come into hospital. And I think for some people who now have a sense of freedom, being asked to stay at home when they want to be in the shops um, is, a, is a limitation for patients. Now, the guidance nationally is that to keep patients safe before we do things to them that might make them less well that that's important nationally that guidance may change as the amount of covid in the community drops but again that's why it's important to encourage people if you need hospital care please talk to us about the importance of that test um, because we really want to make sure that patients are not missing out on tests that may diagnose important conditions. Thank you. Thank you. And we've got Councillor Longden. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I add to the thanks uh, of that? My daughter does work in uh, NHS and my son-in-law. Uh, my daughter's been on COVID wars, frightens me to death, uh, and it's been a bit of a traumatic time for us uh, with them, but so far they've touched me, they've been fine. Um, and also I was blue lighted into the George Elliott and uh, cut up a bit and had a thing stuck in me. So uh, thank you for that and thank you for, for everything that's been going on. Um, 
I think your last slide it was very poignant by saying it's not over. And it was only yesterday where it was announced about a vaccine and the Oxford uh, vaccine, how many been, millions of doses have been ordered, apparently, uh, and also a treatment for it. And already I've heard people say, and I've seen evidence on social media still saying it's all over. We've got a vaccine and we've got treatment, you know. That is going to be one hell of a message now to try and convince people that it's not all over, uh, and there's still going to be it's still going to be taking precautions. Now I don't know how you're going to deal with that uh, as a hospital, but the problems we've had, we didn't know about the significant increases at the Elliot. Uh, it appeared in the newspaper before we had even a word about it. Nobody knew about that. And then afterwards, from a freedom of information request, we found out that a third of that increase actually came from, without, from outside of the borough. Now local authorities are, are moving into having authority to do lockdowns and closures, tighten things up in specific areas where there's outbreaks. We're going to need to have that timely information in order to do that, if people come from Hinckley and Bosworth or North Warwickshire, we're going to need to know where the problems are. Uh, and I don't know if you're equipped to do that. Uh, and I know at one point you had to get the uh, authority of public health before you could publish anything. Well, that's no good because uh, by the time that's gone through that particular mill, um, we're losing we're losing time. Um, we don't want to jump too early because we're accused of all sorts of things. But again, we don't want to be jumping too late because of the problems that could cause the people who might get uh, uh, the disease. Um, we didn't know specifically about Wembrook and the problems there, but there was a there was some work done on that. that which helped get the message across. Um, and the other question I've got really for you, I don't know if you've done it or if it's somebody else's responsibility, it might be public health responsibility, but we need to know at some point if there's been some analysis done of why an Eaton and Bedworth has hit so hard. Uh, uh, because if we've got that information, we might be able to, to, to help stave off another spike, and it's coming. It's down the road. I can feel it in the water. It's coming. Uh, but, but we need to know that information so that we can then try and put some things in place, either with yourselves, public health, whoever. But we need to work together on this. And it needs to be timely and quick. Thank you. Um, so perhaps I could come back on that, Councillor Shepherd. Um, so. Uh, when we spotted the second peak beginning to emerge uh, in June, we pulled together a, a multi-agency team um, made up of uh, representatives from uh, the current council public health team, Public Health England, the CCGs, um, and the provider organisations who uh, who work across the patch. And I think um, it's already been said that we've all been on a very steep learning curve around managing uh, the impact of COVID-19 and, and that second spike for us was, was no exception to that. And I think what we've learned um, in terms of being able to access data and information, being able to analyse that using the expertise that exists in public health England and the public health teams um, locally has been um, invaluable. And uh, we've been writing up our experiences and um, Shadia um, and, and Nadia are going to speak in a moment um, from a, a county council uh, public health perspective. And I'm not sure if there's anyone on the um, on the call from Public Health England. Um, but but the, probably one of the principal um, pieces of learning that we take away from this experience is how we use that information, how we analyse it, how we communicate it, and how we use what it tells us to warn and inform uh, the public, to brief um, people like yourselves. Um, the, lots of learning that's come out of that experience um, uh, from, uh, from that perspective. So I think um, from what we've gone through, pro probably 
amongst the first um, in, in the region to experience an outbreak uh, as we have um, at the George Elliott Hospital is something that we are uh, intent on converting into useful um, operating procedures and policies uh, that, that ourselves, if we're faced with a, a, another outbreak in Nuneaton and Bedworth in due course or across the, the Midlands can use to manage those things. And I'm sure that colleagues from uh, the, the public health team will add to that in, in their bit of the presentation. But I think the partnership that we've de developed, the understanding of what we need to, uh, to look at and what we need to do as a result of that is in much better shape having gone through the experience that we've just gone through. I don't know whether Catherine or Dalja would want to add to that. Yeah, I, I just would say again, I think take your point about the communication and that's why we put that communication slide in to better engage with our stakeholders as we're going through that um, so that people feel uh, are informed and that we can take the right action. And, and again, we know Nadia and Shade are listening, but that close working relationship with public health and the local authority has been really supportive for us. And I think we've got a lot out of that. And, hopefully they have with us yeah I mean I, I totally agree with that and and it's it's not just been about understanding our data and our and, and information um within the community and within the hospital but it's also been helpful in terms of getting some external assurance on the management of the actions that we put in place in in our action plan to to manage the outbreak and um and i, I definitely think there's some close working relationships there we continue to um communicate with them on a, on a regular basis thank you is there any other member that wishes to speak that hasn't already No, Councillor Longdon, you've indicated again. Yes, please, Chair. It's just about what was just said. It, that's fine uh, if these things work, but we're in the game with everybody else, and we do have specific responsibilities now. And our residents are not fools. They can make their own decisions if they given the information for that information to get out we need to be told as well so they're all grown up they need accurate information so they can make informed decisions and that's important and that's what's not happening at the moment it's not happened in leicester it's not been happening in other places and it's certainly not been happening here so i think we need that uh, so that people our residents can make their minds up about what they want to do uh, and that's important that we have that information and they have the information. Thank you. I'll shut up now. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'd just like to place on record the committee's thanks and appreciation for all of the hard work that's gone in at George Elliott um, and also just for taking the time to come, come this evening and attend and thank you for your presentation. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Chair, we do have um, a public speaker and he's now indicated uh, if he requested to speak. My apologies, I thought Councillor Condacore was going to come in at the end. Um, Councillor Condacore? Thank you very much, Chair. This is actually the item I wanted to speak on. Um, obviously, it's marvellous all the improvements we've had at the George Elliott Hospital um, in June. Um, it's really great to know that we've actually solved a lot of those system problems and, and um, like Barry, I was most annoyed by the, the, the slow pace of information coming out um, at the early stages. So I hope we'll never have a repeat of June because we've learned the information needed to get the information flows better. I think it's useful to put some information into context as well. We have 50% more cases of COVID in Eaton and Bedworth than an average town. And that's partly to be expected. And we also had the infection quite late. So um, we didn't have lots of people coming in on ski trips, etc. So the Eaton and Bedworth had a later profile for COVID. Uh, and this second wave in June was really disappointing. Um, and I know, and it's really useful what the hospital said about their new procedures. I think the testing and actually the testing being looped via um, UHCW was a big problem um, and it, it's information yeah we really are in a better place now 
but we should have actually had the alarm bells ringing and a lot of these changes happening earlier. And I'm not blaming the hospital for that because obviously you don't control UHCW, you don't control Public Health England. Um, but we really do need to never have this happen again. So I think we need to be a critical friend on this. We had, I think, 35 deaths in June at the George Elliott. Uh, probably about 60% of those will be from the borough. Uh, in July, we seem to have about seven deaths, and it's been about 12 days since we've had a death at the hospital. So hopefully we're coming right out the the, the end of this dark cloud. Um, but it is really important to realise that yeah, people have died at the George Elliott, who if we had the information and we had the testing quicker and other things, we may have had less deaths. Um, and it's really important to be careful because now we're down to two or three cases in the community a day. Uh, that they may go up, you know, we may have super spreaders, or they may go down to zero. And we keep talking about this R number, reproduction, and we really need to be getting this eliminate policy. If we could eliminate COVID from the borough, or almost eliminate it, it doesn't matter what the reproduction rate is, because that's the multiplier. If we can get it out of the system, um, we're in a lot better place. Whereas if we let cases slowly drift up, um, come winter, we could have a... Um, a runaway of cases. So I really do look forward to actually having more of an elimination policy for COVID rather than just um, a coping with it and doing a little bit when there's an outbreak. Elimination is the way to go. That's what Germany, um, New Zealand, all the more successful countries have done. Um, and I know it's a system approach because obviously the hospital has to work with PHE England and things like the health and safety executive because you have an information of where for people come in from and it's trying to join all those bits up so we actually drive the system out thank you very much chair i think i'd just say that i would agree with that what councillor condacore um, has said about the importance of trying to really now eliminate covid where we can and one of the positive things that we've seen so for example, just to reassure people, we have not seen um, a, a case that we believe to be hospital acquired, either probable or highly likely, since the 28th of June. So that's over three weeks in the trust. And as you can see, uh, as our numbers have fallen in the organisation, pleasingly, uh, the number of, of deaths have fallen in the hospital. So the hospital's in a very different position to where it was either in April or in June. Um, and through the work we've been doing with Public Health England, we have taken the approach of analysing every case that comes into hospital now. So we do what we call a root cause analysis on that to try and look whether there are any connections to other people where we identify the patient. We make sure with Public Health England we're contact tracing any members of the public that may have come into contact, any members of our staff that may have come into contact or if we have members of our own staff who test positive for COVID, we've got a really robust policy now of making sure that we're testing their tra tracking and tracing their contacts as well. So I think you are right. That is the future of really now when you've got a lower level of cases, being able to forensically chase after each and every one in order to try and reduce that number as low as possible. Thank you very much. I haven't got anyone else down to speak, so I'd just like to thank you all again for your attendance this evening. Thank you, Councillor Shepherd. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation um, by Public Health Warwickshire. Uh, I believe I've got Sade Agbula and Nadia Inglis. Yes, we're here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have the slides, please, Wendy? I'll just share my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, inviting us to uh, talk you talk you through uh, a couple of um, key points. So, what I'm going to do is set out some key areas that I'm going to cover in this presentation. I'm going to start off with some statistical and 
epidemiological information because that was one of the requests from the committee. Um, you've asked um, what's happening in terms of the borough and compared to the wider uh, county and other districts. So I'll be providing that information in relation to Nanisin and Bedworth and how it compares to other districts in the county. This will be followed by a description of some of the ways we've dealt with and are still dealing with the pandemic because there we, we are still in a pandemic. I will touch on some of the lessons we've learned till date and I will finish off with an overview of how we're prepared to continue to deal with the pandemic and any further spikes or increases and hope that that would cover some of the um, explicit requests uh, from the committee. So this first slide simply just captures the total number of cases uh, that's been recorded till date in Dunedin and Bedworth. They're slightly out of date because the slides were prepared about a week ago. The total number of cases is now at 862 and the rate is about 667 per 100,000 cases. Um, Dunedin and Bedworth has consistently had the highest number of cases since the start of the pandemic, even before we had Pillar 2 data. So we've uh, had Pillar 1 data up until um, end of May, early June, and now we're recording Pillar 2 data as well. A lot of the cases that we're seeing now is coming from pillar to testing, which is testing that happens within the community. Uh, next slide. Um, just This is just a slide that tells you um, some of the work that we've been doing and ideally should probably have been at the bottom of the presentation. So we've done a health impact assessment on the back of this realization that some areas of the county have been disproportionately impacted upon by the pandemic, which goes back to Councillor Kondoko's question and some of the questions that's been raised already today as to why Nanisin and Bedworth has seen a higher number of cases compared to the rest of the county. We've done a health impact assessment looking at four different areas that health might have been impacted upon. And the analysis has shown us that health and well-being has been impacted deeply by changes and um, looking into the future and recovery. We recognize that any recovery efforts that we pulled together must take into account all of these four areas. Something else that's come out from our health impact assessment Chief is- Chief Inspector Carl Faulkner, Warwickshire Police. Uh, is now exiting. Is the fact that um, the harm from COVID-19 has been unequally distributed across the population and is likely to continue to be so whilst it's circulated. So I'm really glad to hear the point made about um, the our target should be eliminating um, COVID-19 entirely, which is what our outbreak control plan is seeking to do. And I'll talk about that later on in the presentation. Next slide. So that's the chart that, so Nonisin and Bedworth is the pink line. Um, it just simply highlights what I've already said, has had a higher number of cases compared to um, the rest of the county and England. There are areas across the country that have recorded higher number of cases, but obviously we don't have all the other areas reflected on this graph. But we, in thinking about Warwickshire, Nonisin and Bedworth has had the highest number of positive cases um, in Warwickshire. Next slide. And that breaks it down into more detail. So Nanisin and Bedworth is highlighted green, confirmed cases 853, highest. Um, the rate, like I said, is slightly higher now, 667 per 100,000 population. And when you look at that in comparison to Warwickshire, to Coventry and to England, it is higher. We, we've had a higher number of cases across the uh, districts. Next slide. This breaks down um, pillar one and pillar two testing. So pillar one testing, testing that happens within the NHS staff uh, and um, people in hospital, pillar two testing, testing that happens within the community. So for us, testing that's happened in Rico, Edgebaston, and at any mobile testing units is captured in pillar two testing. The key point of this slide is the seven day average. That's the green um, squiggly line that's across the chart. And you can see that it, it is on a downward trend. So both pillar one and pillar two testing, um, positive tests are coming down. And um, if you look at the positivity rates, which we have access to for Nanitin and Bedworth, it is now at 1%, I believe, seven day positivity rate. There's also something that we um, re get um, from Public Health England, which is called exceedance reports. Uh, and that is produced on a, on a regular basis, I think on a weekly basis, and breaks down number of cases over a 10 day period looking at the number of cases compared to expected cases. 
And we have seen that Nanisna and Bedworth exceedance has been consistently green. So within a 10 day period, we're expecting that Nanisna and Bedworth should be having at least 45 to 48 cases. Now they're Nanisna and Bedworth is tracking at about 20. And that's in comparison to some other parts of the county which have seen red exceedances and which we've had to investigate in the last couple of weeks. Uh, next slide. Uh, we looked at some of the personal characteristics of all of the positive cases. Um, and what is clear is that those contracting COVID-19 in the borough are slightly younger than across the county. And uh, many of the positive cases in the younger age groups have come through the Pillar 2 community testing program. I think that's, yeah, that's another quite um, straightforward slide. Breaks it down by Pillar 1, Pillar 2, total number of tests that have been con conducted. I think the, the the fact that you find older people in Pillar 1 testing is probably explained by the fact that Pillar 1 testing happens in hospital uh, in, and picks up a lot of people that are in the older age groups compared to Pillar 2 testing where people can drive to a, a, a testing site and have a test completed. Next slide. We also looked at um, ethnicity breakdown of people that have tested positive and um, ethnicity data not very good um, looking at a sample of positive cases. What's clear is that um, people from Indian, Pakistani uh, and um, other ethnic groups are disproportionately affected in Anisan and Bedworth when you compare to the rest of the county. So if you look at the Indian group, for example, 9.1% of positive cases in Anisan and Bedworth compared to 5.2% in Warwickshire, which is um, possibly due to the fact that you have uh, slightly more diversity in Nanisna and Bedworth, but is noteworthy because of the established um, emerging relationship between BAME, Black Asian minority ethnic communities, and their risk of contracting COVID-19 and risk of dying from COVID-19. So it's, no, it's something to, to take note of. Next slide. Um, we broke down the data that we have available to us by geography. At the start of um, the um, outbreak that happened in George Eliot and in the community, at that point, we did not have access to this sort of data that would tell us what was happening uh, in by wards. We've only just started to have access to that data. It's about, probably about three weeks old now that we now have access to this data. So as it is, we can interrogate what's happening. We've got access to uh, what we call line lists that provides postcode information, and we can aggregate this postcode data and categorize it by ward. And what's come out is that Wembrook has got the highest number of cases cumulatively, so total number of cases. And then in the last seven days, what we did was look at what's happening in more recent times. So you can see Wembrook Abbey and um, um, Exxon have got um, the highest number of cases in the last seven days. Um, and that's that's really something that's helpful for us to know, especially when we're trying to target our comms, um, when we're trying to target siting of a mobile testing unit, for example. And we have used all of this information in taking decisions as to what the next steps are to ensure that we get the right messages across to people in Anitin and Bedworth. Next slide. Simply a repeat of the previous slide, but um, now presented as a map. Um, Wembrook Ward has, has had the highest number of, and, and rates across the borough and across the county. Um, the three wards in the top 10 wards, Wembrook, Abbey and Aubrey, Ob are, are in the top 10 wards by rate for Warwickshire. Uh, and they have had, like I like mentioned in the previous slide, seven cases each in the last 14 days for Wembrook and Abbey. Next slide. So cases in the last two weeks, so between 29th of June to 11th of July, we looked at the data. There's been 27 Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 cases in Anisin and Bedworth, and this accounts for 43% of the total um, Warwickshire cases. The majority have been identified via Pillar 2 testing, which means that it, it's, it probably gives me a bit more comfort because it means that people are going out to and taking advantage of testing. Um, but what we do know is that the number of positive tests have fallen since 21st of June. And I did mention at the start that um, positivity rate has also fallen. That is the total number of the percentage of positive tests per 100,000 tests completed. Um, there's something here about making taking note of the fact that the numbers are very small. So the figures need to be viewed with caution, with caution because one or two case increase might just completely skew the numbers. And without further deep interrogation of it, it is difficult to draw conclusions. But what we do know is 
uh, the fact around the, the positivity is falling and we know that the seven day rolling average um, shows that positive tests have fallen since 21st of June. Next slide. Um, these are the deaths that have occurred in the borough registered up to um, deaths occurred up to 3rd of July and registered up to 11th of July. And um, it, it does appear that Sunanese and, and Bedworth is the um, pink, the, the, the non-COVID deaths is the pink line, the non-COVID deaths is the blue line, uh, the pink um, line is COVID deaths. And um, if you look at the table underneath it, you can see that the highest number of deaths were recorded in week 15. But there is there, there was obviously a downward trend between week uh, 19, 20, 21. And you can see the line coming down for COVID related deaths. But there was a sharp increase between week 24 and week 27. And we've had a look at what could be responsible for this. And this coincides with the time of the Jojelian outbreak where we saw uh, an increase in number of cases and consequent increase in number of deaths subsequently. Uh, next slide. That um, just breaks it down by place of death. So the people that have contracted COVID in the borough, where have they been dying? So um, largest number of deaths have occurred in hospital, 123 deaths, um, care home, 22 deaths, four deaths in hospice, um, six deaths at home, and a total of 155 deaths up until the 11th of July in, in the Neaton and Bedworth. Next slide. So this this now takes me into what we have um, done so far in relation to responding to to the pandemic. What I would like to state um, as a starter is that we have been in response mode since the pandemic was declared in in Warwickshire, and um, we have been working with a range of county partners. So we haven't done it all ourselves. We work really closely with Public Health England. We've worked very closely with Jojeliot, has um, verified by Catherine and Daljit in their presentation. Um, We've worked with yourselves as well and with the other districts and borough councils to ensure that we target our messages appropriately. We've worked with local businesses at the peak of the pandemic. There was a lot of guidance that was coming out and we needed to translate this to it for a range of settings. We've done a lot of work in that respect. Educational settings, we continue to work with them. Care settings as well, done a lot of work supporting our care homes, set up an out of hours router to make sure that care was consistent and it was 24 seven. And we work closely with our community and voluntary sector. And we continue to do that. Uh, we continue to provide specialist support and advice. I've talked about developing local guidance. We've undertaken bespoke analysis. So a lot of analysis still ongoing. I've talked about exceedances uh, at the start of this presentation. We continue to translate whatever information we get from Public Health England into a usable form. So when we find something, we, we're, start, we're starting to develop something we call an early warning system, which is what we've done in relation to some of the exceedances observed elsewhere in the county. We do a lot of analysis to interrogate the data and understand whether there's any clusters that's happening, whether there's any link between the cases, whether this is an emerging outbreak. And that is a lot of um, a lot of time goes into that and sharing with par partners um, with, our, um, with our business intelligence team. We continue to design public health campaigns. There's a new campaign that is being designed now. Uh, let's do it for Warwickshire. We set up a community engagement cell uh, last week and where it was agreed by everybody on that cell that Nuneetin and Bedworth was going to be a priority area. So some of the campaign materials, which I've already seen, have been translated into uh, meaningful content for, for Nuneetin and Bedworth as well. You should be seeing that very shortly. Uh, and we have supported setup of, of the shielding program with, with yourselves as well. Uh, we continue to function in, in business continuity mode with the launch of our local outbreak control plans as well. Uh, last slide, I think, is that the last one? No, that's not the second to the last slide. So some of the lessons we've learned very early on is that relationships are critical. Um, communication will be the first to, to admit that this is a different um, terrain that we, we are operating in. It is not customary for, for us working with Public Health England to tell districts and boroughs about every single outbreak in relation to some of the other traditional outbreaks that we've had to deal with. So if we have, have a Legionnaire's disease outbreak, for example, or a meningitis or a mumps, there are certain processes that we usually adhere to. 
but we very quickly realized that we cannot operate in that way, uh, especially with some of the feedback that we've received from yourselves and the other uh, district and borough councils. So we have streamlined and fine-tuned our communication. We've got a clear communications protocol and we continue to communicate with everybody that needs to know. Um, we are, like I said, still in response mode. We are dealing with a, a, a higher number of outbreaks compared to uh, um, Coventry and Solihull. We are part of a beacon. Um, but we are having to deal with a higher number of incidents and outbreaks in Warwickshire. We continue to do this and work with a range of settings to make sure that we quickly identify and isolate close contacts. We are addressing gaps in testing availability. So one of our quick responses to the um, outbreak in Judge Elliot and within uh, Nuneaton and Bedworth was to ensure that a mobile testing unit was deployed rapidly to Herfield Road car park and it was kept there for a longer period of time. Something else that we've done is to commission a, a testing service um, so that we can have access to increased swabbing capacity and be able to deploy that testing service to places where it would be impossible for uh, people who need a test to, to get to a mobile testing unit. Um, we continue to make sure that we disseminate the messages around physical and social distancing and, and some of the control measures that have worked so well at, at the start of this pandemic. Um, our view is that we cannot abandon what has worked well up until lockdown and beyond. And we continue to make sure that those messages reach everybody, um, regardless of where they are. I think the la last slide, please. So this is going to be addressed in the last um, point that I was going to talk about, uh, where we are and how, how we're prepared to continue to deal with the pandemic. You're probably all seen our outbreak control plans is published, is on the microsite um, and is available if, if people haven't seen it, I'm happy to have it sent out at the end of this meeting. It's published on that site and it sets out clearly how we are going to um, manage outbreaks. The aim in our outbreak control plan, the overriding aim is that we want to reduce cases to zero. And it states that clearly within our outbreak control plan. So that is that has always been our ambition. We have had some days, consecutive days, where we've not had any cases in Warwickshire. And I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that we'll get there. So we've got eight priorities within our plan. We continue to work with our communities. I've, I've talked about a community engagement work stream that is working to build trust within the community. We continue to work with a range of key settings, high risk settings to support them to prevent infections from happening in the first place. Continue to provide support to our shielded communities and vulnerable people. I've talked about testing capacity, the fact that we have MTUs and we're able to rapidly deploy MTUs as and when needed. We've got a fantastic relationship with our military planners and we, we know where they are at any point in time. And if I say to them today, there's an outbreak in a certain part of the county, I need an MTU by 9 a.m. tomorrow, they will make it happen. We we'll continue to uh, work with Public Health England to get the right data and information in relation to contact tracing. And um, yeah, all of this work together to make sure that we hopefully get to that point where we no longer see um, cases across the county, not just in the Neaton and Bedworth. I think that's the end of my of my presentation. Thank you, Thank very, you very much for the presentation. presentation. Um, before, before we go on, go on to members' questions, questions, just to double check, Councillor Condacor, did you also wish to speak on this item? Okay, I'm going to move on to members' questions. So I've got Councillor Brown. Many thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, the graphs that we saw that compared COVID deaths with non-COVID deaths, are these deaths all deaths that involve COVID? So where COVID-19 was the primary cause of, cause of death, or, or, or does it exclude the ones where the, somebody had a primary illness and COVID was incidental but present at death? So the way deaths are recorded is that um, any, all deaths due to COVID are deaths where there has been a positive confirmed test of COVID or where COVID has been mentioned at the death certificate. Right. So so, so it, it's all cases where it was present. So, so somebody could be primarily ill with, a, with a, another, another illness, uh, but because COVID was present at the time of death, they count as being 
death due to COVID encountered in these statistics. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm saying, making this point is because it, historically we've got a, a, an area in Nuneaton Bedworth which people have a higher incident of health issues than perhaps elsewhere in parts of Warwickshire. So perhaps it's to be expected then that people who've got health issues are, are more likely to be categorised as having passed away with COVID as well as because of it so solely. Um, it, uh, the other thing is, have we analysed the data where communities fall across authorities? Um, I'm thinking of the village of Kersley, for example, where part of it falls within Nuneaton and Bedworth, part of it falls within Coventry. Um, it's a higher scoring area but not necessarily one of the highest. But if we're not counting the data that comes from the Coventry part as well, we're not necessarily getting the data that relates to the entirety of the community. And we could be missing uh, a, a, an area where there is actually a higher instance and needs action. But because the data is spread across two authorities, we perhaps miss it. Um, so I just want to know, are we looking at the entirety of the data for communities where they're split across authorities? The data we have at our disposal is, is data that is for Workshire. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that that sort of crossover has been taken account of when the data is made available to us. Right. Unless, um, um, Nadia, you want to say something else in, in relation to that? Hi. Um, yeah, I suppose I have the privilege of being working at Coventry City Council as well. So we we see the Coventry data. Um, I think we'd be very mindful if we saw some of these borderline um, areas, if they bordered, um, you know, the county and we were seeing exceedances there. We'd certainly be having conversations with each other um, about that. So, you know, obviously we have access to both um, um both sets of data. Well, I have access to both sets of data, and we're working quite closely together um, on this. And also, Public Health England would be alerting us as well if they were seeing clusters that crossed borders. Um, so we're we're not strictly working just to authority boundaries, if that makes sense. Yeah, many, many thanks for that clarification. That's all I have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Tandy. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> My initial uh, comment was very similar to the, excuse me, to uh, to the one of um, the previous speaker in relation to the recording of deaths, because I think one of the um, frustrating things that people felt at the very beginning, I have to say, was that every single time there were reports of how many people had died or an individual had died it was that there was always an underlying health problem along with the covid and i think that did cause some confusion amongst people um, you know amongst local residents because it was you weren't going to get COVID unless you got something else wrong with you, which we know was completely wrong. But that was uh, part of what um, they wanted. The other point really was, I accept that once you were aware Nuneaton and Bedworth were um, the highest, uh, had the highest proportion of COVID cases and deaths in Warwickshire, that the testing, uh, you know, you did more testing. But questions were asked, certainly, and I live in Wembrook just as much as, as the chair of the committee lives in Wembrook and represents Wembrook. Questions were certainly being asked out there on the, uh, uh, in the street about, well, why aren't we be now that they know that Wembrook and Abbey and Arbury have the highest level of, uh, of COVID, why aren't more people in those areas? being tested rather than just generally across Nuneaton and Bedworth. It was a question that, that I was asked and obviously one that I couldn't answer. So it'd be interesting to know, <clears throat> so I can answer them, how people, you know, why people in those areas weren't tested uh, more vigorously than anywhere else in the borough. So um, my answer to that is, um, in relation to a point that was made earlier on, 
around um, elimination policy and what we're going to be doing to, to make sure that we eliminate COVID. And I was going to make a, a, give a response to that, which is that a lot of this also relies on people um, complying with the messaging and, and taking advantage of testing. When we decided that we're going to cite an MTU in an 18, the question was asked about whether Harefield Road car park was going to serve Wembrook. And, and the answer I got was yes, that it was going to serve Wembrook. We did a lot of boosted comms at the time, encouraging people to go out to test. Um, there was a lot of messaging on, on, on social media. There was a lot of messaging on a range of websites. There was also on the ground messaging, because around that time as well, we decided that uh, social media messaging was probably not enough. So working with our comms colleagues, working with comms within the Nathan and Bedworth Borough Council, uh, we decided that we needed to put in flyers and posters around urging people to go and have a test. There was, it was around the same time I was in the Nathan Town Centre as well, um, and, and I gave an interview in the Nathan Town Centre, again, reiterating the messages that people go out to test. Um, I also asked the military planners um, to extend the time that the mobile testing unit was going to be sited in Hereford Road. Normally it's there for three to four days and then it's in res reserve and then it's moved to another location. We kept it there for a week, um, to, uh, encouraging people to go and get tested. So the messages were out there. Uh, I'd be, I'm not averse to exploring other ways by which we can get down into the community, to the to the communities with that messaging. One of the things we are exploring is using um, well-known community leaders. So Julie uh, Jackson has agreed to do some work for us, possibly a video, for example, that can be available to people in the Nissan and Bedworth. We're looking to use faith leaders as well. We're working with Equip as well to see whether we can use um, people that faces that people are familiar with and can trust to, to um, disseminate these messages even, even better. We're also looking to use community champions and identifying community champions that can go into these communities and, and spread the messages. So I suppose my point is the, the, the MTU was there. Um, we put out the messages, put out the boosted comms, and we, we just need to rely on people to go out and get tested. Thank you. Councillor Duffin. Hi there. Um, June's kind of covered a lot of um, what I was going to ask really about um, communication because I think um, the, the important kind of takeaway from the, the whole thing has been that um, people haven't necessarily been as clear on the messaging as they need it to be and therefore compliance hasn't, ne hasn't ne necessarily been as high as it should be. Um, particularly around um, those areas that we are still seeing kind of high uh, rates and then those areas that maybe haven't come down in the way they should so Heath's included there it wasn't mentioned as being on kind of the high, higher end of the list but with four cases within those two weeks it's kind of one of the higher ones um, what lessons are we able to learn from those wards where um, that isn't necessarily happening and even places across Warwickshire um, how, how can we learn from that to kind of stop that as an issue um, within those wards where it's kind of an issue continuing really um and also i can't remember what my second point was going to be maybe i'll come back to it um yeah have you got a question an answer for that sorry i'm not sure about the question are you asking what lessons we've learned from from areas where we've seen spikes yeah i'm, I'm talking about so within like the last two weeks and i know it's kind of taken with a pinch of salt because it's a few weeks ago um but we've got some areas where um, so Heath's an example. There are areas that are very similar demographically where the numbers seem to be coming right down. Um, and Heath seems to be a bit a bit of a standalone area in the fact that those numbers are still quite high. So I'm just kind of asking, really, is there anything we can learn from those areas where numbers are coming down um, to explain maybe um, how we can deal with those rises in those other areas? There, are, there, there could be a myriad of explanations as to why numbers are coming down in some places. It could be due to people behaviour, it could be due to population behaviour, it could be due to the fact that they're not going out to test, because if we don't test, we don't pick up positive cases. It could it could just be down to people doing the right thing, it could be down to um, maybe a different um, approach to policing or people engaging with the police in a different way. There are all sorts of explanations. So it, it, we, I, it's, it's difficult to compare apples and oranges. What we do know is that we continue to keep an eye on, on the numbers. I've talked about an early warning system. I've talked about accidents reports. 
which are early screening tools that would tell us whether we're seeing a spike uh, in, in, in specific areas or not. And I've talked about the borough as a whole um, being rated as green, and it has been rated as green for the last three weeks on the PHE accidents report. So we are not seeing a higher than expected number of cases in the meeting as pre at present. We did have an increase. We had a spike around the time of the Jojelo outbreak. We had a community, we had community transmission ongoing, but that has come down. And one of the slides that I presented shows clearly that the numbers are coming down. One size does not fit all would be my summary answer to that. So whatever it is that's happening in one place will need to be interrogated on a case by case basis. OK, brilliant. Um, and just another kind of quick follow up on the comms thing. As we said, we've kind of emphasised the importance of, of the messaging and, and people kind of going out for um, testing. Um, if would that be um, so where those spikes occur, would that be on a borough wise uh, comms strategy or would that be broken down even further into individual wards um, and targeted um, on kind of like a micro scale? Ideally, uh, individual wards. So I'll tell you about some of the work we're doing with our military planners. The intention is to is to map out a range of sites across the county where there will be an MTU that can be sited that is within 15 minutes driving distance to anybody that needs a test. And that's some of the work that our military planners have been doing. I sent an email out to every district and borough in the last week, introducing the military planners and establishing contact. So somebody should have received an email, whether Simone or Brian, somebody would have received an email and would have identified the appropriate contact person so that the military planners can work with them and ensure that there are sites ready to go because in, in order for us to deploy testing we need to have a list of sites that are ready to go because there are all sorts of things that need to happen for a site to be suitable now as we move out of lockdown there are less sites that are available um, that would meet all of the criteria to have an mtu but we are um having a plan B in the, in, in the in the form of our commission service. I, I did talk about the fact that we are commissioning a testing service that will be able to address some of the um, disadvantages that come with having a mobile testing unit. That has gone out to tender on Monday, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Nadia, and we're jointly commissioning the service with Coventry. So that should be in place as well. And that will solve all of the problems with people not being able to drive to an MTU site, for example, people that needs to have a test at home. The commission service will tick all of those boxes. So ideally, yes, that is what we're working towards. But we need to all recognise that this is a situation nobody's ever been in and we're learning as we go along. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor London. Thank you, Chair. It's where to begin for me. Um, let, let me start with asking the question about how do we find out who will tell us uh, and when do we find out what the R number is for the Eaton and Bedworth? And I think that's very pertinent. Um, nobody seems to want to tell us and we can't find that information out from anywhere. I've been on looking all over the place to find out what the R number is and I can't find it. Um, with, with the issues of testing, uh, and to a certain degree tracing. If somebody goes out today and they pick up the virus, it, it could be between two and 14 days before they actually get the symptoms. Now, some people will go for testing uh, without symptoms, just for peace of mind, and other people will wait till they get the, the symptoms and then get tested. So what is the value in that? because they might not, may not know that they've got the virus and they could be going out and then they could be passing it on as well. So all these things coming together, we need to know in a time in which we haven't been getting, despite the assertions that we have, but we haven't, and some of the information that has come out has been tagged as confidential or restricted. That's that's about as useful as a, a colander with any with, without any holes in it. And we need to know that information because if we are going to be responsible now as local authorities for trying to control this in our areas, we need to have that information five, five minutes after the people who got it, who, who, who are holding it. And we need to know all these things, particularly where we've got these localised outbreaks, so that we can take that uh, take those actions uh, in conjunction with other partners. 
and it's just not happening at the moment and I don't know why it's not happening but we certainly need to know and if without that information we're powerless and we're going to get the blame if we get the spike everybody else will wash their hands a bit oh not our fault the local authority and if we act too quickly we get the blame if we act too late we get the blame and everybody else points a finger uh, and i'm not prepared to accept that so i want some guarantees that we're going to get the timely information and the information that's useful to make to, to let us make decisions thanks chair okay um so that's that's two questions there um the first one is about the hour number um the hour number for Nuneaton and Bedworth, I cannot tell you that number because um, that is not published information. I can tell you the R number for the Midlands is 0 0.7 to 1.0. And the reason why R number, when you start to think about, when you start to get down to small numbers, is that it cannot be measured directly. So there's always uncertainty around its exact value. And it becomes even more problematic when you start to calculate R, num R value using small numbers of cases, which is what we have now either due to lower infection rates or smaller geographical areas. When I've, when I've been asked about our numbers in the past, I have always been given the same answer, which is that it doesn't tell us the complete picture. So while it tells us something, it, it, can, be, it can mean very different things when you have a thousand cases um, with an hour number of one and a hundred thousand cases with an hour number of one. They mean completely different things. So I can tell you the Midlands hour value, which is 0 0.7 to one, but I can't say, tell you what the Nanesian R number is. Your second question about the value of testing, if asymptomatic, is I, I think that's the question you asked. Why do we need testing if somebody doesn't have symptoms? Is due to the fact that one person can infect two other people or two or three other people, and then they can infect two or three other people, and that grows exponentially. What that means is that we are only unable to identify contacts. So if somebody doesn't have symptoms and they test and they test positive, that is one strategy of containing the of, of containing the, the, the pandemic or containing spread or growth. What we did with lockdown was almost a an ecological community type of managing the spread. You keep everybody at home and that means you reduce the number of people that could potentially get it. When lockdown eased, we needed to put in place something that will counter any effects of easing the lockdown. And that is what the test and trace is all about. And that is what we're hoping to be able to achieve with our commission service. We will not be hampered by the fact that it is only people that have symptoms that can get tested. We can test anybody, regardless of symptoms. And when we test somebody and they test positive, it's quickly, it enables us to very quickly able to identify whatever contacts they've been in contact with and ask those people, to ask them to, to, to self-isolate. And that is one surefire way of ensuring that the infection does not continue to spread. I'm not sure if that answered your question. I think the question you asked was, what's the value of testing if asymptomatic? No, the, the, que the question was, because it takes uh, two to 14 days to, to show symptoms, Yeah. It, somebody could be going around with that virus, not re realise that they've got it and passing it on to other people uh so yeah where is the value of the testing in that and how do we calculate that and how and i mean if it happened to me if i was yeah. going around different places i wouldn't yeah. know where i'd been you know I'm, old, I'm an old bloke now i ain't got a clue what i'm doing well well all the evidence tells us that even though asymptomatic spread does happen a person is most infectious when they are symptomatic and when, when they are coughing and, and they've got all of the symptoms of COVID-19. So, yes, it is still important to test. OK, thank you. It's, it's still I'm still confused about it. It's not uh, it's not going through for some reason. It, it, there just seems to be this gap that, that seems nobody can fill because of the time it takes to show. Uh, and people can still pass it on without even knowing it, quite innocently. Some might do it deliberately, but, there's, but most of them would be innocent. Uh, innocent I, I, to, yes, and I agree. And I, see, I see that point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, ultimately, uh, a vaccine is going to answer that question. But until we have that, we'll, we'll have to make the best use of what information and evidence we have available to us. 
Thank you. We have Thanks, Chair. Councillor Tandy. Did you want to speak again? Uh, yeah. Councillor Tandy, I believe you're muted at the moment. Sorry, Chair. I'd like to go back to the point that I made earlier in relation to that when uh, when people who were in the highest areas, which, as you said, were Wembrook Abbey and Arbury, um, they were that information didn't come forward until very, very late in the process. And the answer was, well, you know, we asked local councils, which they did to tell people where the dangerous areas were. And effectively, the answer was we expected them to go out and get tested. But there were probably many people within those areas, and we know what sort of areas we're talking about, um, who maybe was too scared to go out of their doors to get tested. Maybe there were disabled people who were too, couldn't get out to get tested. And it, I just... I'm not very happy with, well, it's up to them to do it. You know, if if there was a danger in those areas, in my view, then they those people should have been um, voluntarily tested by either, um, you know, NHS England or, by, or, or uh, by the County Council. Not trying to be... Um, awkward i'm not trying to have a go at anyone but i do know that there are many many people in certainly in wembrook and abbey who were very very bothered about leaving their homes um, to get tested and it's not very easy to say well if they weren't leaving their homes they weren't gonna uh, you know they weren't gonna catch covid because they could have caught it from somebody who was delivering their groceries so i do think that there should have been more care about people being tested uh, quicker in those areas where there was a danger. Thank you, Chair. I, I take your point. Um, like I said, this is a learning process uh, for all of us. There perhaps could have been some more targeted work that could, could have happened. But I did make a point earlier on about access to uh, community testing and what was happening in the community. We didn't have this information until um, early in the month of I mean, mid middle of June before we started to have access to what was happening in the community. So there was no way we could have known that that sort of thing was brewing in the community. And when we had access to that data, that influenced a lot of the decisions we took subsequently around boosting communications to that area, around sending out those messages, around making sure that um, we put in a, a mobile testing unit. I see that you're shaking your head, so my explanation is probably not holding water, uh, but that is what we could do at the time. In terms of people that may not be able to leave their homes um, because they were afraid of leaving their homes, um, that is the sort of information that we could have used to target those people um, specifically. But at the same time, we continue to push out those messages around social distancing, hand washing uh, for people like that. It's not, this is, this is the, in order to tackle this, we need to, it's almost like triangulation of different approaches. Testing is not the be all and end all. Um, face masks or face coverings is not the be all and end all. We still have to continue to social distance. We still have to continue to wash our hands. And that's why when it was probably not as easy to get to people that probably would not have gone out of their house to test. Those messages were consistent in terms of ensuring that you continue to wash your hands and socially distance. There's also, I mean, I, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not placing the blame on individuals that may have found it difficult to go out, but I would be, I would hope that anybody who was finding it difficult to go out and get a test would have reached out. There's a lot of offers of support um, provided by Warwickshire County Council would have reached out to their GP per perhaps and would have and would have expressed that that they are unable to get out and they want to test and we would have taken them up we would have taken that up and would have acted on that that is what I would have hoped and that's what I'm still hoping anybody that finds it difficult to leave their homes reaches out um, to the range of offers the, to the range of um, avenues of support that is uh, available across the county.
thank you. Nabia, did you just want to come in there as well? Is that all right? Yeah, just to say we absolutely recognise the gap around um, people who may not either want to go out or may not be able to get to a testing site and for whom home testing is not appropriate or um, and and therefore have built that very strongly into the commission for mm. the new service because we want everybody to be able to access a test if they need one and that was a, a really specific gap and so we have had it highlighted to us you know by individuals by professionals mm. where people have struggled to get a test and so you know we were looking at ways of how do we how do we bridge that gap and this is one of the ways that we're we're doing it and you know have set up the commission as soon as we possibly could um understanding the new testing structures as they are now so um, i'm hoping some of that gap will be be bridged in terms of people who really can't access a test um any other way thank you uh councillor hancocks yes thank you chair there's been a overarching theme um, tonight uh, across all the presentations and that's about lessons learned and the way we move forward and that's really important and our role as an overview and scrutiny committee that part is an overview of what we're doing and we need to also scrutinize what's happened in the past but it's really positive that people are recognizing those lessons learned in, in such a difficult time and how we move forward and um, Chair, if you, you, you'll allow me, I've got um, three questions. Um, probably the first two to Dr. Agbula, but the third one, I'd actually like, if possible, um, I don't know whether Chris Bain is still with us, but I'd like a view from Housewatch as well. But my, my first um, two, and I, I do want to reinforce the issue about communication. And I'm going to come back on that because that needs to cascade down as far as possible, even to councillors, because we get asked when we're out and about in the streets or around the town. Like that. <coughs> anyway, I'll come back to that. Chair. But um, towards the beginning of the presentation, there was a chart, and it was the number of cases. And I think it was 661 or something. That figure. That's I'm the rate. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just interested. Um, if the, uh, if the data is there to tell us what percentage of people came from outside of the borough that's recorded in that, because there, there has been rightly or wrongly concern in the, in the community that there's been a large influx from other areas sent to the George Elliott rather than to UHCW or somewhere else. And my second question at this point, and I've got a third one to come back to, uh, but my second one, um, and it, it, it may be me, Chair, I apologise if it's me, but there was also, uh, as part of a chart, uh, four deaths recorded against the hospice. The hospice in Nuneaton doesn't have any residential, as far as I'm aware, so does that relate to a different hospice or the hospital home figures or... Or what? It just confused me. Thank you. I'll come back in a minute. Yeah. So the first question around uh, the data, the numbers. So I said uh, there's 860, uh, 853 on on that table on on that slide, and it's now about 862 total cases in Nuneaton and Bedworth till date. That includes everybody that's tested positive from pillar one or pillar two testing with a Nuneaton and Bedworth postcode. So that does not include people that have come from outside to test. Well, Bob Chair, we've all got CV postcodes. The, the data that is reported to us verifies that anybody that is included in that number has got in the Neaton and Bedworth is, is because we get access to the line listings and we're able to cross check that. So that is uh, for the Neaton and Bedworth numbers. Right. So nobody from outside of the borough? Well, but, I'm not the data collator, so I'm not going to say 100%, but that is the data that we've been given. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, so the second question around hospice, I'm going to have to check that. Um, I, I didn't know that the hospice in the Nisi did not have residential care, so we can take that back and, and come back and confirm to you. But again, 
that is data that is uh, publicly available and has been made available to us. Okay, I'd appreciate that if we could get that information. Uh, you know, it, it, it's still a figure and it's attributed to, to that section, so I'd be interested to know how that's been collected. Yeah. And uh, just, just finally, Chair, and I'd be interested um, also to hear from um, Housewatch, and it takes us back to something Councillor Longdon touched on earlier, and this is the scrutiny part of our role. Um, it's been clear that nationally and locally that the uh, necessary data hasn't been cascading down, as I've just mentioned. And now that it appears there's going to be more responsibility put into the, uh, into the local authority sector, it's really important that that data um, is spread out as much as ourselves. So I guess my question is, uh, and is, is it the case that people have been experiencing, and particularly with Housewatch, I'm sure they speak to their colleagues in other parts of the country, is it the case that the feeling is that that data hasn't been uh, cascading down to, to local authorities in a timely manner? Thank you, Chair. Is that a question for me? It might be for comments from both yourself and Hal. Yeah, what uh, what we hear from um, patients and from residents is that uh, they feel that there is a lot of information um, floating about, but there isn't a lot of clarity around the information. And it's really hard for them to make sense of what they're hearing. And in many cases, what people are reporting is information overload. And what they actually need is communication and not just information. I don't know what your impression has been, Shade. We are getting a lot of data now. Um, we're getting some data that is publicly available so anybody can access it. We're also getting some data that is um, strictly available to only public health, local authorities, public health teams and Public Health England. And then, yes, you are right. There is a bit of information overload and a lot of work goes into distilling the data and information that we get and, make, and to trans translate it into a form that is even remotely usable. So I can imagine that members of the public might be struggling um, if we need to take all of that time to even produce them into forms that it is not just data, it is actually intelligence and it is information. I can imagine that people will struggle. What I can say now is that as part of our outbreak control plan work, we have a microsite. And I did say at the start that I will send, make sure that that is sent out if you haven't seen it. There is a data dashboard on that microsite that is publicly available. Anybody can access it. It is very easy to understand. It provides information about numbers of cases across Coventry, Solihull, Hall and Warwickshire, numbers of tests conducted, number of outbreaks, number of deaths. And it is very easy to follow. And perhaps that is some, um, again, learning for, for, for me, um, Councillor Hancock, in relation to what you said around maybe publicising that a bit more, because we have publicised this to our key partners, to our stakeholders, but perhaps there's more we could do to make sure that members of the public have access um, to, to, to the information on that microsite. It is worth saying that as the amount of information that's out there has increased over the course of the pandemic, the number of people ringing our helpline um, to, to gain clarification has been escalating. Yeah. And we've had more in the last week than I ever remember. I arrived in Healthwatch in 2014 and we've never had a week like this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak that hasn't already? No. OK, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank you very much for your attendance on behalf of the committee. Thank you very much for answering the questions and your presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I did put my hand up again. Not to worry. Oh, 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 oh. You were to use that Oh,
I'm moving on to agenda item six. I'm not aware of any other items, um, so I'm going to bring this meeting to a close. Thank you very much for everybody's attendance and contributions this evening. Um, and I'd like to just ask IP, the meeting is now ending.